I would like to start. Um, I'm very happy to be able to, to welcome Sebastian Witz from Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Stuttgart in Germany. And he will talk today on um, X-ray probes for time-resolved magnetic imaging. So Sebastian, thank you very much for, uh, for being with us today. And the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Barbara, and uh, welcome everybody um, to my presentation in which I will show you um, how we can use um, soft X-rays from um, a synchrotron for time-resolved um, magnetic imaging or time-resolved magnetic microscopy of magnetic objects and structures and processes that are um, so small that we cannot use op optical or other techniques um, for imaging. So we need uh, soft X-rays in this case. Um, so the presentation will be about um, X-rays and magnetism. If we think of magnetism, um, it's basically quite present in our everyday life. So we have um, toy trains, there's a compass, uh, and more in uh, the direction of technology. We have MRI scanners, for example. And if we think of um, more data storage, data processing, um, there uh, has been around the hard disk drive for quite some time. And more recently, there's also um, magnetic random access memory in the market. And uh, those two things uh, already have in common that uh, the magnetic uh, um, functional units are um, smaller than what we can resolve using uh, visible light uh, imaging. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are much smaller or uh, much below 100 nanometers in size. And um, more recently, there also has been the proposal um, for using magnetic waves or spin waves um, for uh, data processing. And here, the same applies. So if we want to understand uh, the underlying physics of these waves and their dynamics, we need to have uh, an imaging technique that is capable of, of, of resolving magnetic structures of the order of 100 nanometers and below, and also to do it in a time-resolved um, fashion. Um, okay. And, um, yeah, to show you what is basically there already, um, I, I uh, show you this map of magnetic objects and processes. So um, we have, for example, magnetic domain walls or magnetic vortices. And um, on, on the dynamic um, map, there are spin waves or magnetic precession or writing of data bits. And here you have um, the length scale axis going from microns to nanometers. And uh, correspondingly, there's also, there are time scales uh, from microseconds to femtoseconds. And if we consider um, optical microscopy, or optical microscopies, then we immediately see that they have a... Um, uh, a very good time resolution going down to femtoseconds, but on the other hand, they are um, lacking somewhat spatial resolution. So that's limited to the wavelength of um, visible light, typically. And on the, on the other hand, um, there are um, electron microscopies, which have a very good spatial resolution, Yeah, um, but uh, they are typically not um, very good um, for time-resolved experiments. So they're somewhat complementary. The same applies um, to scanning probe uh, microscopies, um, like magnetic force microscopy or nitrogen vacancy microscopies. They are also typically not performed in a um, time-resolved way. Um, so that leaves uh, some part of this map basically uncovered, yeah, in this green area here. Uh, with very interesting um, phenomena and physics inside. And that is what we actually can cover using um, soft X-ray magnetic uh, microscopy. Yeah, that's shown here in green. And um, this is what the talk will be about. Um, and for the outline of my presentation, I will um, first introduce the necessary magnetic contrast mechanism to you, that's X-ray magnetic circular dichroism. And then I will um, introduce the technique that we are using, this abbreviation, tr 6 that's time-resolved scanning, transmission, X-ray microscopy. 
And after that, I will show you um, a few examples how we can use this technique to image directly magnetic waves or spin waves and how we even can um, extend um, this method um, from ferromagnets to antiferromagnetic materials using a different um, mechanism uh, for uh, magnetic contrast and that magnetic linear diagram. And now if we look at the interaction of um, X-rays or soft X-rays with magnetic materials, um, then we, we, we see basically two different regime, regimes. So there are um, hard X-rays and typical magnetic experiments here mostly rely on scattering of X-rays, whereas for um, soft X-rays, absorption is much more important. And by soft X-rays, I refer to energies between 100 electron volts to maybe 2 keV and corresponding um, X-ray wavelengths from 10 nanometers to half a nanometer. So that is what we have. Um, for details of interaction of X-rays with magnetic systems, I refer to this book here, um, um, which is Magnetism from Fundamentals uh, to Nanoscale Dynamics by um, Stör and Siegmann. And that covers everything in great detail. And for this presentation, um, uh, we mainly need uh, the effect which is called X-ray magnetic circular dichroism, or XMCD, uh, as magnetic contrast. And that's a resonant effect, so occurring at the resonant absorption edges of elements. And um, it basically describes that the circularly polarized X-rays are... Um, or if a magnetic system is exposed to circularly polarized X-rays, then an electron can be excited from core states into um, delocalized bands. For example, the, the P states into the D band. And um, then there are two separate things to be considered. First of all, these electrons are already spin polarized with respect to up and down spins in the excitation process. And then also there's a difference here in the density of states at the Fermi levels Fermi level, um, and that together leads to um, an effect that you can see here, that there's a difference in absorption depending on how the magnetization in the sample or the magnetic state of the sample is oriented towards the photon um, propagation direction. Yeah, so it's proportional to the uh, projection of magnetization to photon propagation. And this effect is typically quite strong. It can be easily of the order of 10%. And um, it can also be used for quantitative um, determinations of the absolute magnetization, and even it is sensitive to spin and orbital moments separately, which we will not use here. So for us, it's just a contrast mechanism at one particular energy, but uh, it can be used in principle. And uh, in the soft X-ray range, there uh, are a lot of applicable um, transitions that can be used um, for this XMCD effect, as you can see here in this um, element table, with, for example, simple magnets as the 3D transition elements, iron, cobalt, and nickel can be directly accessed here. And now to the technique, um, which I already mentioned is scanning transmission, X-ray microscopy. So what we need for that is at the first step, a, a soft X-ray synchrotron. In this case, we are doing it at the Bessie II synchrotron in Berlin, but um, it is applied also at other um, uh, synchrotrons uh, right now. So um, first of what we need uh, is a monochromator in the beamline um, because we want to just have photons of a certain energy, namely of that transition edges we are looking at. And by that, we are also sensitive to different materials in, um, in, in, in the sample. Um, and what, uh, in addition to that, we need is, um, uh, for example, an undulator, which provides us with circularly polarized um, X-rays. Yeah, so that we need for this XMCD effect. Um, and as we want to do, Microscopy, we also need to have some focusing optics, which in our case 
is a Fresnel zone plate, which is a diffractive lens, yeah. and that uh, is able to focus the X-rays onto a spot of, say, 10 to 25 nanometers inside, in size. And then we raster scan um, our sample um, through this focal point here, and then behind the sample, there's a single point detector, which collects the transmission level, and um, this together uh, yields a two-dimensional image. So that's for the spatial resolution. Yeah? And uh, what we need in, in addition to that, as we want to do time-resolved imaging using X-ray, um, we, we, we need to make use of the specific time structure of the electron in the ring, ring here, of, of the synchrotron. And we perform a, a so-called pump probe experiment. So we, we excite our sample by an electronic pulse or magnetic pulse. And we synchronize this excitation uh, to the synchrotron. Um, and this is illustrated here. So the X-rays come in certain flashes that are spaced by two nanoseconds in time. And then we excite the sample and we can use the X-ray as a probe, or the X-rays as a probe for the dynamics that are um, arising in the sample, and by that we can uh, achieve temporary resolutions of about 10 picoseconds for periodic processes. So we cannot look at single events, but we have to look because signal to noise is not good enough. But uh, we have to look at repeated or periodic events. Um, so this uh, sticks them as one realization of um, soft X-ray microscopy. They, there are certainly others, like um, full field microscopy using two lenses, or holography, holography, and typography techniques. And this everything can be extended also to, to three-dimensional imaging. And on the other hand, one can also use um, electron imaging. Um, which would be an x realization here. Um, in terms of time resolution, however, Stixum has the benefit that we can make use of the whole um, intensity of the synchrotron. So we can use all the different uh, probes that are available and not only a single bunch, for example. Okay, so that's what we have for the technique. Now, uh, coming back to the, the object, the magnetic object that um, we were looking at or that we used as an example, um, and that is, uh, these are what I mentioned in the beginning, um, so-called spin waves, so magnetic waves. Um, as I've drawn here schematically, um, the, the orange arrays correspond to the magnetization in the sample that is basically pointing in one direction, but there's a temporal perturbation of this. So what the, the, these individual magnetic moments perform a local precession, um, where there's a phase shift in space, and th that defines basically the wave, as you can see it here. And this wave, as a whole structure, propagates into a certain direction. And from a fundamental point of view, those um, waves have been uh, already investigated for quite some decades. In quantum mechanics, they are treated as quasi-particles, the magnons, and it was shown that um, those can even be brought into something like a Bose-Einstein condensate or Magnon Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, what is more recent, however, is that um, also there were proposals to use these waves as signal carrier for future um, data processing or information technology devices. And this is mainly for two reasons. Um, first of all, uh, the propagation of such waves um, is not uh, associated with moving charges yeah, in contrast to current signals. Um, that means that ohmic losses um, can be avoided, and if the magnetic damping in the system uh, was low, then um, power consumption of spin wave devices could be much lower than present CMOS technology in principle. And on the other hand, <clears throat> there is um, the prospect of miniaturization because the wavelengths of spin waves are typically orders of magnitude smaller than that of electromagnetic waves of the same frequency. So that are the two things which make 
been very interesting in terms of application. However, if we want to ever use that in technology, we need to find um, new concepts for generation manipulation and detection of spin waves. And in particular, um, this miniaturization aspect is important. In our work, we were focusing on uh, excitation of spin waves uh, with wavelengths below a micron. So that has been very difficult in the past to do that in an efficient manner. Um, and that is what we were addressing so far. And what we use for that so is, is um, a specific magnetic structure, which is called a magnetic vortex or a pair of magnetic vortices. So typically for spin waves of wavelengths above a micron, one can use uh, lithographically patterned antennas or metallic conductors. However, that doesn't scale to a wavelength uh, of 100 nanometers. So what we are going to do is um, to use uh, these magnetic objects here, and they are defined, um, so again, orange determines uh, or sets the magnetic direction in the material, yeah? So that's, it's called a vortex because the magnetic flux is closing in the structure via these triangular magnetic domains. And what is in the center is a so-called vortex core where the magnetization goes perpendicular to this plane that I've drawn. And this object has only a size of 10 nanometers to 100 nanometers in size. And we want to use that as excitation, excitation sources for spin waves. Um, and now I will show you the first example. So we, we made samples of this kind, metallic samples. So these are two ferromagnetic layers. Um, ah, this I forgot, sorry. Um, in terms of uh, detecting spin waves, there's not only, there are not only microscopies, but there are also scattering techniques. Um, they are, there are um, optical techniques like BLS really in light scattering and neutron and um, resonant in elastic X-ray scattering, which cover either very short wavelengths uh, or, very, or longer wavelengths, and there was this gap in between which we tried to fill now using direct imaging, phase uh, coherent imaging using X-ray microscopy. So now we, uh, I show you um, examples of these structures uh, we were aiming to produce or fabricate. So we have two uh, ferromagnetic materials, thin films, which are patterned into micron-sized structures. So this, the two films, magnetic films, are cobalt and nickel iron, and they are spaced by a non-ferromagnetic ruthenium layer. And now we uh, went to this um, X-ray microscope in Berlin, which is the Maximus end station, and we can first perform static imaging. Uh, using X-rays, and here you see a direct map of the magnetization in the sample uh, separately for the different layers, because it's uh, uh, the effect XMCD occurs at the resonant absorption edges. We can separate the signal for two different layers, and you see that there is this vortex structure present in uh, both layers with opposite depths as we wanted to have. So this anti-parallel vortex circulation. And then we can directly also resolve the center of this vortex structure. It's the vortex core in the middle, which I uh, mentioned is pointing yeah. perpendicular to this plane here. And we see that these vortex cores, these fine magnetic structures are parallel. Yeah. So this is actually the state that we wanted to have, and we can, using uh, direct sticks and imaging, we can show that it's in the samples, that it's present in the samples. So now coming uh, to the time-resolved aspect of um, of the method, um, we excite this the whole structure now using a alternating uh, magnetic field of one gigahertz frequency, and we can directly observe the response. And, and this I'm going to show you now. So um, this is a movie in time, um, super slow motion, of course, because the dynamics is happening on the nanosecond time scale. And you see that from the center, from this core, this perpendicular core in the center here, waves, magnetic waves are excited, which then propagate to the edge of the structure. 
Um, this movie contains both topographic information, like sample defects, and the magnetic dynamics. We can go to a more normalized view where we just highlight the magnetization dynamics. And here you see this, these waves excited at the center more clearly and the spiraling fashion. And, um, yeah, what, what we can conclude is that actually this, this tiny magnetic object, the vortex core, acts as a nano stirrer and can be used for the excitation of short wavelength nanoscale spin waves. This is all not a resonant process, but um, works on a broadband scale, so we can directly change the excitation frequency, and we see that we can directly tune the resulting spin wave wavelength by changing um, continuously the frequency between, say, 1 gigahertz and 4 gigahertz, and the wavelength changes from about 400 nanometers to 100 nanometers here in the 4 gigahertz case. So we can really directly observe spin waves uh, on these time and length scales. Um, yeah, um, this is, these are not the first examples of magnetization dynamics using Dixon. So there have been many in the past also addressing um, spin waves, where I want to highlight these two works here. Um, the difference is, however, that here um, the wavelength is truly below um, the optical resolution limit. So that's the first example of um, wavelengths coherently observed on uh, wavelength uh, scales of 100 nanometers. Um, when we come back, however, to the application point of this, we see that we have a very nice uh, point source for spin waves. Yeah? Um, but what we see at the same time is that they're already by, given by the geometry. Uh, there's quite some decay of the amplitude because just the phase fronts become uh, longer and longer and the energy needs to be conserved. Um, so we were also looking into ways um, to, 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 to change that, yeah? to get to a different excitation geometry. And this can be done by uh, introducing um, so-called magnetic anisotropy into the system which means now we changed a little bit the magnetic constituents, and then um, this caused that the magnetization is energetically uh, favored to be al uh, aligned along one axis. So before the, this vortex was continuously in the rotation, now it is split into this B domain state here for the in-plane signal, and in between there's a so-called magnetic sharp domain wall um, between connecting these domains. Yeah? And in a similar way as we were using this vortex core before, we can also now use the whole, this whole domain wall to excite uh, plane waves in the system. So we go to similar frequencies on the gigahertz scale, and uh, you see directly that now we have plane waves excited in the sample, which can easily propagate over far distances not losing a lot of amplitude. Whereas in the center here, you may still see this also the spiraling effect from the core that's stemmed out much faster compared to the plane wave, just by geometry. And while these are still two-dimensional waves, we can also change geometry or dimensionality of the whole thing. And we can confine these waves to the domain walls by going below a certain frequency. And then there's no mathematical solution anymore for waves in the domains, but only in um, the domain walls, as you can see here. So that's a 500 megahertz excitation. And we cannot only apply continuous waves, but also um, pulsed excitation, so we can create a wave package of spin waves and um, observe the propagation of this wave package inside of the domain wall. Um, yeah, these were examples for, yeah, in summary, um, domain walls act as sources and channels for spin waves and for the source similar to a magnetic vortex core shown earlier. And these were all examples on uh, pure ferromagnetic materials uh, for time-resolved um, 
magnetic imaging using soft x-rays. We can also um, go to different systems, um, uh, for example, ferry magnets, where um, now there's not, magnetization is not pointing only into one direction, but there are two magnetic sub-lattices pointing into opposite directions, and one of them is a little bit stronger than the other one, so uh, um, the total magnetization resulting is quite small, so using standard techniques or optical techniques it is quite difficult uh, because of the very small system of this um, net magnetization to de detect anything. Um, however, using um, X-rays, we are, uh, depending on the material, we can be even sensitive to different um, coordination of, say, iron atoms in a yttrium iron garnet film. That's, that's the name that's known for very low magnetic damping, and in this case, it was doped with gallium. So what we can see here, this is the XMCD uh, effect over energy, and we see um, there's a change of sign, and we can address basically the two different sublattices with full signal. And this we can, uh, although the magnetization is quite low, we, we, we can achieve quite a strong um, imaging signal. So that's now showing this lithium iron garnet film. And here we actually patterned a metallic antenna on top where we send an AC current, which creates an earthed field that excites the spin waves directly um, in the film without any domains or vortices. And here you will see the response um, at 3.5 gigahertz. And thanks to this very low damping in in the in this in the in this material uh, uh, YLG, you see that the waves are really propagating over very uh, long scales without apparently losing a lot of amplitude. Yeah? So that's a scan range of 25 micrometers. So that's quite big, and you see multiples of waves um, or wavelengths uh, as propagation lengths. Um, this can also be shown in this normalized view, um, where we only see the magnetic changes. Um, it's already quite visible in the first case, but here it even can be seen even better. Um, we can also look at not only wave dynamics, but also uh, dynamics or domain dynamics at different um, frequencies. Here is an example of, of the same uh, sample at now much lower frequencies for the excitation, about 120 megahertz. And you see um, different magnetic domains here. And they can be also brought to quite a strong uh, uh, dynamics. Yeah. So you see them basically dance around uh, in response to the excitation. And in the normalized view, it's even visible, uh, it's even stronger. Visible. And that brings me to the point of that we can access actually a quite a wide range of time scales using this um, Stixon technique, time resolved Stixon technique. Um, I will show you now examples for different excitation frequencies covering quite a wide range. Um, and starting from um, one megahertz. Um, and we can increase the frequency, 10 megahertz. So this, uh, apparent, I mean, the, the, the speed to play this has been adapted to the frequency so that it's not in comparable real time. Yeah. So the, the higher frequencies will be played much faster. Just that you see something. And that's, uh, increasing frequency, 1 megahertz, 100 megahertz. One gigahertz where we have these waves again, that these waves which I showed you, and using a special operation mode of the synchrotron, we can even go to frequencies of about 30 uh, gigahertz or higher you know, in the so-called low alpha operation mode of BSE2. So what we can do here is we can cover actually uh, quite some orders of I'm afraid we lost the sound.
Baba, did you say something? Yes, um, in, I was somehow deep. I don't know if it was a local problem for me, but there were a few seconds where I didn't hear anything. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. It seems uh, other. Uh, yeah. What, I don't know. Maybe uh, twenty seconds, not more. Okay. Okay. Well, I was just saying that, um, yeah, we can cover a wide range of frequencies, as you can see here using the technique, going up to about 30 gigahertz in this uh, low alpha operation mode of the synchrotron. And, yeah, that, that I hope that not too much else was missed on the slides before. And now as a last example, I wanted to show you that, um, well, this was uh, using always X-ray magnetic circular dichroism as a contrast uh, method. We can also use linear dichroism. Um, and this is interesting because uh, recently there's quite uh, some effort to look at antiferromagnetic materials where these two sublattices I mentioned earlier are really fully compensated intrinsically. And this would allow um, also um, dynamics or, or Dynamics in these systems is exhibited at much higher frequencies than in ferromagnets going up into the terahertz regime. Yeah, so that would open up a field for terahertz spin wave, terahertz magnonics. Um, and, uh, however, we cannot use circular dichroism because there's no magnetization in the sample, no net magnetization. But there's another effect. Um, that is called XMLD, as already mentioned. Um, we show this now as an uh, example of the, the previous material, um, yttrium iron garnet, which still has some residual magnetization, but also shows linear dichroism at the same time. This is just a proof of principle. And now again, we have a, a magnetic vortex structure, as it was um, shown in the middle of the talk. And this is how the magnetic contrast for the in-plane magnetization would look like using XMCD. Then if we excite the sample with very low frequencies, around 70 megahertz, we see that the central core that would be sitting here, um, now we are only sensitive to the out-of-plane perpendicular magnetization, performs this small gyration here. And now we can look spectroscopically first uh, at the energy dependence when we use not circularly polarized light, but linear polarized light, horizontal and vertical. And we see that there's also a strong um, XMLD effect depending on how the uh, spin axis is oriented with respect to the linear <coughs> polarization of the light. And we can go, for example, here to this energy point and make an image, take an image, and now we are not sensitive anymore to the direction of magnetization, but to spin axis. However, the benefit is that this would also work in antiferromagnets. And we can, in the same way as for the XMCD, we can perform time-resolved imaging, as you can see here in the corresponding movie. So that's just a good perspective for the future um, that we can also directly look at antiferromagnets. Um, which is quite difficult to do by many other techniques. Then I will come to the summary. Um, so I've shown you that one can use time-resolved soft X-ray microscopy in the Stixum realization uh, to achieve um, a combined resolution in space and time of about 10 nanometers and 10 picoseconds, um, also for a magnetic object using XMCD. Um, where I have to say that this time resolution, however, only applies to periodic processes. We cannot look at single events. Um, in the past, we have shown that one can directly look at spin waves of the order of 100 nanometers in wavelengths, and one can use natural magnetic objects such as vortex cores and domain walls as sources and um, channels um, for spin waves. And more recently, uh, so far not published yet, um, we can use XMCD also for sublattice imaging of fairy magnets. We can cover a very wide range of uh, frequencies and we can use XMLD <coughs> for imaging of antiferromagnets. 
And this brings me to the acknowledgements. Um, so a lot of people contributed to these works, actually um, from many different uh, institutes. And in particular, I would like to highlight um, Lina Meyer from uh, PSI in Switzerland. She did the work on the gallium yik, this ferry magnet. Joe Bailey um, for the XMLD dynamics. Um, Volker Sluka at the time at HZDR in Dresden um, uh, worked on this domain wall um, excitation and spin wave channels. And Markus Weigand, who installed basically the, the Stixum at Bessie and uh, which we are running now together. And of course, I would like to thank the organizers um, for inviting me here to share that with you and uh, of course all of you for your attention. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for this very nice talk and for the really exciting pictures and, and movies that you showed to us. Other questions? I already got some very nice comments in the chat that the, the, the talk was super interesting. Um, but maybe there are questions. You might as well just speak out loud if you have a question. Yeah, um, yeah please. Um, can I ask a question? Sure, of course. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the for the nice presentation. It was very interesting, I think. So I'm familiar with sticks and for catalytic applications for like in situ characterization of oxidation states of different sites, but I wasn't aware of these magnetic applications. So my name is Emre Hozansoy from Bilkent University, Ankara, Turkey. Um, so I was just uh, kind of interested in like a very basic question. So in, in the very first examples that you have shown where you had this circular, uh, you know, uh, magnetic patterns, they were all clockwise in direction. So I think that's a function of the polarization, right? So if you just switch the polarization, that would have switched the direction as well, right? Are you referred to this? Um, can you see that? The spirals that you were showing it. Ah, like the spirals. No, actually, um, that, yeah, these, these uh, ones, yeah. Uh, that, that is dependent on, um, so I, I refer to this small central um, core, which mm -hmm. is called the vortex core in the center of the static structure. And the sense of the spiral is defined by whether this is pointing upwards or downwards. So it can point into both direction and is energetically um, the same, basically. So it's just a metastable state whether I, uh, they point up or downward together. So oh, that so is defining the sense of the spiral. In some other images, it, it could also just uh, look as if it's spiraling counterclockwise, right? So yes, yes. It depends, chance, right? it depends it on the orientation of. Um, this vortex core pointing upward or downward. I see two quick, three quick questions. Actually, one of them is um, so uh, p did people look at like one dimensional monorod type of application for like uh, these kind of things for like uh, to visualize the packages in one dimensional objects like monorods, which might be uh, prepared in magnetic ways. Um, yeah, I, I know uh, that people are looking at um, let's say magnetic nanotubes. Mm -hmm. For example, um, on nano wires. Yes, this this, uh, this can be the case, and uh, using this technique, uh, it's possible to to resolve at least to some extent um, the spatial and dynamic uh, characteristics, depending on the size of this object. So, as I said, in our and real world. If I may, one point. Yeah. Please. Uh, one, one, one final question is like the temperature effects. So. Uh, you know, have you ever looked at temperature effects, the effect of temperature on these patterns? Like if you go very cold, for instance? Um, not on these particular samples, because they are not going to change a lot. But um, so we have a, a cryostat available um, in the in the stixum and um, in, in ferry magnetic materials. Yeah, um, this one here. Um, they often have a so-called compensation um, point. Which means that above this temperature, um, one, this, the, the, let's say the first lattice is dominating. And if you go below a certain temperature, then the other lattice is dominating. And in between, there's perfect compensation, which would correspond to an anti, an anti ferromagnet. So we are in the process of, of these things where, or materials where you have a certain phase transition at different temperatures. So it's, it's, uh, it's possible to, to do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there more questions? Yeah, there's somebody. Please. 
Okay, thank you very much for your nice talk. I'm wondering if you can do the same experiment with this different structure, use the iron and nickel as a, I mean, uh, with, with cobalt. Uh, can you do that with supermalloys or permalloys? Is there any reasons that you use uh, these materials? Can you change your structures and the same results? Uh, um, okay, so here we use um, this nickel iron compound that's referred to as permalloy sometimes um, that we use because it has a very low for metallic systems a very low magnetic damping um, cobalt is also not bad and okay. in the top layer does it change your results I mean you have um, yeah so it can change the results in this case here for example we change to cobalt iron boron and this introduces anisotropy so that Anisotropy would, would change the re result quite a bit. Um, otherwise, if the damping is low and the magnetization is uh, not of the same level, it's not going to change too much. But if the magnetization is changed by a factor of 10, the dispersion relation of this, these waves is going to change. But um, as long as the damping is not too bad, um, too bad, uh, I, re I refer to Pamela has a damping of about the Gilbert damping of about 0 0.01. If you are on the same order of magnitude, it would um, uh, be possible uh, to use other materials, I believe. Okay, I have one more question. You are interested on diluted magnetic semiconductors. Do you think that if you add the manganese to the, I mean, gallium arsenide or this structure, you would see the same effect, or it would be very difficult? I mean. Can you, could you please comment on this issue too? Thanks. So, uh, I'm afraid I do not know enough about diluted uh, magnetic semiconductors. Um, uh, if, if that's possible or not. I mean, in principle, I believe we should see some, if there's magnetism, XMCD should be able to resolve it. If it's not super, super low, um, whether it would sh show the same kind of dynamics, I have to admit, I, I cannot give you a, a proper answer to that question. But is, there, is there any chance for collaborations if we could prepare such a samples and uh, I mean, we could take a look at them at your facility? I mean, is there any in, chance? In principle, okay, so uh, there are different ways how this could be done. So normally this is a, a user experiment. Um, that means that there are um, calls for user proposals and in, in our case um, of, of Bessie 2, they are typically, I believe, uh, 1st of March and 1st of September. And uh, then you can apply for beam time. Of course, it's also possible to contact us if you just want to test something and one can discuss um, possible collaborations for sure. There are also other synchrotrons like the Swiss Lights in, in Switzerland. They have also a big and, and diamond in UK. But yeah, we are, we are always open for collaborations, of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, are there more questions? You might just speak out loud. Is it because it's a little bit difficult to see all the participants on a small screen or medium-sized screen? It's not to be the case. Maybe I have a question. I mean, it's it's really beautiful science, science and um, I almost don't dare to ask um, about, um, how to say, future applications in the sense um, that is there some, 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 how to say, industry interested in what we are doing? I mean, it's, it, it's um, how to say, in, in the age of digitalization and miniaturization and, and I don't know, in, speed up of information processing and so on. I imagine that there will be lots of applications. Of course, I mean, it's kind of proof of principles um, yeah, that so you're working. And as I said, sorry for the stupid question, but that's what everyone no, yeah. is, is asking nowadays. So, but I imagine in particular, yeah, in the sense of, I don't know, this kind of um, semiconductor industry, uh, yeah, high-tech industry and so on, I imagine that there might be some interest of collaboration and so on. Could you shortly comment on that? Um, that's, uh, yeah, I think it's a good question. <laughs> and yeah. so, to be honest, we do this because we are mainly interested in the um, 
basic science uh, of this. Perfectly uh, understand, to, yes. To have some kind of motivation that really people think this could be used in uh, future data processing. However, it's mm -hmm. a very far way still to go and I don't see really that this would be before 10 years time to that we would find this anywhere. But on the other hand, uh, for these reasons I mentioned earlier, um, that there are, is basically in the propagation of these waves, there's not a lot of heat um, created and heat yeah. uh, is, is a big problem in sure. present uh, super, super uh, computing and also for small devices to get even smaller, it is a problem. Um, but I cannot really foresee whether it's, it's really going to be used or or not. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Yeah, but um, yeah, as I say, yeah. science as, as such is already beautiful, so it's yeah. enough of a reason to do this research. Um, okay. Ah, there's a question in the chat. Um, me... how, long, how long? The question is, how long does it take uh, to, to produce such a movie? Uh, I don't know, that whoever um, asked it might as well comment in addition. Not. I can just uh, say it's about um, what you see on this slide. <clears throat> this would take, uh, it's quite fast actually. It takes maybe five to ten minutes. So mm -hmm. that's um, relatively fast because the effect is strong. XMCD has, can be 50% contrast, even or higher. And then um, um, we are sometimes in the lucky position that it will be fast. Sometimes not. Okay, thank you. So it's